With hundreds of women running in this year's midterm elections, 2018 is shaping up to be the year of the woman. It's, time, it's a time when women are also taking a stand for equal rights and opportunities in their public and private lives, setting the stage for change. As we continue this morning's discussion on leadership, we'll be hearing from political trailblazers from across the country. We're looking forward to hearing more uh, from them about their journeys and how current Latina leaders can serve as mentors to those just beginning to explore their interests in politics. Please join me in welcoming on stage Texas State Senator Sylvia Garcia, who is running for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives in this November's election and could become the first Latina elected to Congress from the state of Texas. Chris Tabel Cruz, the director of uh, new leadership at the Center for American Women in Politics, a unit of the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University. And Lori Chavez de Reamer, the mayor of the city of Happy Valley in Oregon, and a candidate for a seat in the state's House of Representatives. Juleka Lantigua Williams, an 18 year media veteran who recently started the production company Lantigua Williams and Company, will be leading this conversation. Juleka, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for telling them my age. <laughs> I'm striking that from my bio, just veteran. Uh, no numerical <laughs> reference. <laughs> it's okay, lady. 40 is fabulous. That's right. Um, and 50 is better. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, of course, we have to start with breaking news out of New York, right? Uh, young upstart in the Bronx, Queens, District 14, upsets 10 year incumbent, whom the New York Times called a uh, kingmaker. Ladies, <laughs> I'm talking, of course, about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who uh, was declared the winner um, by about four percentage points in the last night in the Democratic <laughs> primary in New York. She's 28, Latina, from, you know, the hood, some people <laughs> might say, but her message has really resonated. And so I want to get these leaders to tell us a little about how do we contextualize such a victory? Please. Yeah. So, well, I think it speaks to... Um, the new generation, right? And as a mayor, uh, we're closest to the people as you can get, uh, knocking those doors. And that's what we saw, the grassroots that really came out and why, why did it matter? And it was because she could connect with those voters at the door. She made sure that she said, here's my message, here's what I wanna represent, and how do I mirror what I'm seeing at the door? And I think that that's where you're gonna see the difference um, in these you know, young, first of all, becoming young voters, and then becoming speakers in your community and then being able to represent exactly what you've been working so hard to do. So I, I couldn't be more proud. Just as, It doesn't matter which, which side of the aisle that you sit on. Um, what's important is that are you representing your community? And so she should be um, give herself a pat on the back and say, that's how you do it. That's how you have hard work. And that's how you get things done. Yeah, I agree. So we have a political scientist here. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no. Um, so my research is on uh, Latinas in local politics, specifically in New York City. So I've been following Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's election um, and her campaign, and it's been very exciting. Um, I think that she is representative of this, you know, group of Latinas that I've gotten to know over the course of my research that are very much so interested um, in entering elective office after a period in which they maybe saw themselves as not necessarily interested in that because they thought it wasn't the best way to advocate for their communities. And so a lot of these women are coming from community organizations, nonprofit work, uh, campaign work, and uh, maybe previously they weren't being recruited by some of the major political power players. Now they're kind of making their own way um, and finding different avenues because they've realized that this is a way that they can advocate for their communities within a system. Great. Well, Sounds I think up? it's exciting, but I think for some of us, it makes us feel like slackers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at 28, I was just getting out of law school. And, uh, but I think it's, it's very heartening to, to see uh, young, young people so energized. And I know when I served as president of NALEO, the National Association of Latino Ele uh, Elected and Appointed Officials, it was always so great to see so many young people running for many offices, from school board all the way to, to Congress. So I think it's great. I just hope that this energizes uh, our young people to vote. Uh, because I know for us in Texas, they really don't vote at the level that they should. Uh, so I think it's, it's good. It's good for, for, the, um, for, her, for her, of course. 
uh, and it's good for the country. And uh, I'm just excited about it, and uh, I hope to uh, see her in, in Congress in January. Beautiful. So actually, I want to make a point that you guys are not slackers, uh, first of all. <laughs> um, you are actually outliers, each of you, in your own way. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what made you possible, right? What makes someone like you in each of your respective fields, both personally and professionally, what was it, do you think, that made someone like you possible? Let's start with you, Senator. Well, I think for me, it's always been about not giving up, working hard, uh, and staying focused. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually ran for this office when it was first, the district was first created back in 1992. That was, in fact, the first year of the woman. So I've come full circle. I am running, I'm running for the same seat uh, in the second year of the woman. Uh, but I'd like to tell all my friends that it's not just the, the year of the woman this year, it's the year of the Latina woman. Uh, because that, as we have seen, there's so many of us that are running and so many of us that are gonna be here in Congress to, to join in the fight. And our fight is the fight for working families. I think uh, that's already been stated earlier. It's uh, what we want is no different than what everybody else wants. Uh, we were focused on jobs, education, health care, and of course, immigration reform, because that's important to our community. Uh, but we want a good America, the America that our parents work toward, the, par the America that our, our grandparents dreamed about. So that's why, why I'm there, and uh, it's just been a lot of hard work, and dream come true. Okay. Christabel? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, for myself, um, I, I personally feel as though my research kind of brings back together everything that um, my community has done for me. So I grew up with parents who were organizers in Latino local politics in New York City, and they really inspired and pushed me to get involved. And I just realized that the majority of the people that were helping me and sort of moving me along were other Latinas who were often um, you know, doing the, the grunt work, the groundwork, but just weren't the candidates. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, pursue my PhD and do research on these Latinas and figure out why aren't they the candidates more often and how can we make sure that we support them so that they are the candidates and that they win. Um, and then I've started working at the Center for American Women in Politics because they just do amazing work advocating for um, women to enter the political system. And so, um, you know, they were very supportive of me throughout my graduate career and continue um, to be supportive of my career now um, and, you know, the work that they're doing has been going on for 20 plus years. It was there for the year of the woman, the first year of the woman, right? Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that women are still, after all these years of them doing this work, you know, less than a quarter of, of you know, representatives in these different levels of office. And so um, I think there's a big aspect of the, that center that sort of speaks to my heart and, and kind of pushes me um, to go forward and move forward and sort of hope to change even more. Madam Mayor? Yes. And so little did we know we'd be, you know, when you take a snapshot in time, you think to yourself, did I ever think I would be sitting right here at this moment at 50 years old and speaking to a group of Latinos when you didn't even pay attention to what you were setting yourself up your whole life? So I ran for mayor eight years ago um, and as the first Hispanic female mayor in Happy Valley, Oregon. Did that make any sense? Sure. I could run a city. I ran a family. You run a business. Um, you don't realize what you've been setting yourself up for your whole life until it hits you. And so just quickly, I was uh, explaining that, uh, you know, my 97-year-old grandma, um, you know, you see your name in lights, but do you ever hear your name? So if she's watching, <laughs> Nettie Perez Chavez, this is why we're sitting here, right? This is why at 97 years later that you go, wait, was I made for this moment today when I was asked to come here? And, and then you represent your community and you think, wait a minute, um, there's somebody else who I can mirror who looks at you and says, wait, this is why I'm here in this moment. And so it's been a focus for me to now go back and raising twin daughters who are 23 years old, the youth in my community, because not everybody has that uh, Hispanic, Latino community family, and we all know what that means, right? We all know that if we turn at any moment in our family, somebody's going to be there to help us out in that family. But in our communities, that's not always true. So it was important for me to focus on the youth in Happy Valley to say, you know, it's going to be your time soon. 
hence the 28-year-old from New York City who can take a seat at 28. We have to now go back and say, you can do this as well. So we were made for these moments. <laughs> you were made for these moments. And, and it's time for us to stick together. And in Oregon, I mean, 12% of the population are Latinos, 12% in Oregon. Um, but it won't be long in 2050 that we have maybe a third or or um, even half who will change the elections that we're running for. So we have to pay attention. We have to educate them and let them know that they can be just as powerful to elect us, and then we can turn around and elect them, and then they will succeed and, and move forward. So that's yeah, what I'm excited agreed. about. So to your point, uh, District 14, which she won, is actually a majority minority district. That's right. Right? And so I want to pivot to this notion that basically what's good for Latinas is good for the rest of the country. I firmly live by that philosophy, <laughs> um, but you know, I am one. However, there is this term going around which is called the Latina advantage, which premises that if you get a Latina elected, they will buoy other non-Latino candidates up and down the ballot. So take it, political scientist. <laughs> <laughs> well, is that true? I'm actually, I, I feel very fortunate because uh, one of my dissertation committee members is Christina Bejarano, who wrote the book, The Latina Advantage. Um, and so uh, I think what she found through her research, she was studying in Texas, um, and so what she found through her research is in these statewide legislative races, um, Latinas are um, successful even in majority white districts because they're able to, first of all, the gender identity kind of softens some of the unfortunate racial stereotypes that we have to deal with from voters. Um, and at the same time, uh, Latinas are able to um, appeal to multiple groups of people. Um, and so different political scientists have used different words to describe this, but it could be something like strategic intersectionality or using an intersectionality framework. The fact that someone, a Latina, just naturally like these women have intersecting identities that can appeal to mass groups of people um, can in many ways be seen as an advantage. And um, I think that's something that we're definitely seeing. Now we've got, I think it's seven, uh, you know, Latinas out of uh, securing nominations out of 100 um, women in this coming cycle. So um, we're starting to see that more and more that they're able to do that. And that's something that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez definitely did in her campaign. Mm -hmm. um, she made sure she put out campaign materials in more languages than had ever been put out. She's representing Queens and the Bronx. The Queens is like probably the most diverse area in like the, in the country, right? And so she was, at least in terms of language diversity, so she was able to sort of um, pick on those things that someone else might have missed um, because they don't understand what it's like to be second gen, right? Or they don't understand what it's like to come from um, a family where you have members who don't speak English, right? So that's just one example of the many ways in which she sort of took that advantage and ran with it. Yeah, so Senator, you said that you, you would be happy to welcome her next year, but I'm wondering what can you and your colleagues already in the Senate do to not just encourage verbally, but to materially support more candidates who can join you uh, in the ranks? Well, I think it's important that we always remember to lend the, lending, the helping hand. Uh, whether it's it's in office or out of office. And for me, it's always been about having mentorship programs, hiring young people, uh, either as volunteers or on staff. It's always been about speaking to groups that, that, to help encourage it, because you know, we're no different than anybody else. If we don't run, well, then we're not gonna win. Yep. Uh, and certainly as an office holder, I've mentored a lot, a great number of uh, young um, elected officials now in Houston and to have done fundraisers for them. I'll, I'll, I'll pay for some of their mailers. I'll give them money from my own campaign uh, account. And I think those are the things that we have to keep doing uh, to grow the base and to begin the, 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 the bench, uh, because I'm not gonna be there forever. You all are talking about 30 and 50, or no, 40 and 50. Well, I think 60 is pretty good. Hey. Uh, you know, I'm, but I'm not, you know, I've gotta make sure some 60 years on there, you know. I carried AARP card for a real reason, not just for the, <laughs> not just, not just for the discount, right? But, but, you know, I've been involved all my life in public service because I'm committed to it. I, you know, I started as a social worker. I, I grew up poor. I'm one of ten children. I know what it's like to open that refrigerator door and see nothing but the cold water bottle. You know, I know what it's like. So I fight for working families to make sure that they get a shot at the American dream. And as long as we have people committed to doing that, 
I'm going to be there to support them because we've got to build the pipeline. We can't do it alone. It takes all of us working okay. together. So I actually want to have the mayor answer this question because you said something that I really appreciated earlier about uh, Ocasio-Cortez, which is that even though you're a Republican, you're happy that she won, that you welcome her as a fellow Latina politician. So how important do you think it is for Latinas to run on both major pa party platforms? Yeah. So uh, I'm running for the state house. And if elected, I'll be the first uh, Hispanic Republican in Oregon to take you know, a state leadership. Why is that important? Because we're representing everybody. And I think it didn't matter. Um, you know, which side of the aisle, if we don't work together, we know I'm whether, again, if I bring it back to family, whether I bring it back to a city council, whether I bring it back to a school board, if it's not somewhat balanced, we don't have the real conversations that solve the problems. We have one-sided conversations that we tend to then see the problems over and over and over again. And I think that that's what has to change. And if we're going to be representing uh, any minority group, um, we have to remember to stay balanced so that we, we can hold hands and that we can say, you know what, we can do this. One, because we're strong. Two, because we represent a population that's growing. And three, because, you know, when I think about, you know, women, what we really can do and the power of that. And we can bring along men. We're in a man's world in politics. Steel. That should change, in my opinion. We should be able to represent. We're smart. We're talented. And... Uh, we can work across out, and we and if we can, we should have seen us in the green room. Really, they had to shut the door because we got so loud and talking and, and already talking about these issues and how could we work together and solve. And I've just met these women just in the last few hours, so that's the power I think in the balance and in both sides and representing um, everybody who's on the ground who can vote and then bringing up the the new leaders to say it's okay, it's okay if we're different. Um, we can have a debate. And then now let's solve the problem. OK, so I know you guys have a ton of questions. I'm coming to you after this one. OK, <laughs> so hold on to those. Make them good and brief. Um, but Christabel, yes. the so-called sleeping giant, mm -hmm. are the women going to be the ones to wake up the so-called giant? Or is there no giant? What's up with the giant? <laughs> <laughs> Is this a myth? The giant lives in the beanstalk. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I, I, the sleeping giant, a lot of people have said this is a myth. I mean, I think, personally, one thing that's exciting about the, the, the Latino electorate right now is that, like, 44% of it is made up of millennials. Um, and millennials drove, like, 80% of the growth amongst the Latino electorate um, since from 2012 to 2016. So that's a, that's a big thing. So I think, I think this is, like, something coming out of, you know, newer generations. But I also feel like with women, um, we are definitely seeing that, but I do feel like Latina women have been the driving force behind Latino politics this entire time, right? And so um, I think it's something that we don't want to forget, right? The work that the senator right. has been doing, that the mayor has been doing, like, they, these, they've been the driving force really this whole time. And so I think that um, that's something that sometimes gets lost when we think about the history of Latino politics or we think about representation. We don't tend to think enough um, about the role that women played and we don't tend to highlight those women as much, but they were there and they were doing the work. And especially in terms of politics, um, you know, if we're looking at like local politics or just, you know, nationally, Latinas make up that majority of that uh, Latino uh, elected officials. So. All right, thank you so much. All right, lady in the glasses right here in front of me. Yeah, you. Is like three glasses. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and use the mic. Hi, my name is Sarit Morales, and um, I actually grew up in Juarez in El Paso, mm -hmm. Senator Garcia. So what I wanted to ask was how you guys ground yourself in your culture. I just know personally being in the United States was kind of a, a dif it was different for me because I feel like I lost a bit of that. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you guys keep up with your culture? Great question. I make tamales every year. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's kind of funny. We talk about that as a, as a joke, but you know, for my daughters, um, you know, my mom's Irish and my dad is Mexican. My husband's Portuguese and French and Dutch, so my kids are of mm -hmm. of all mix of, of all sorts. But it's important to carry the tradition. So again, my 97 year old grandmother with my 23 year old twins, if we can get together once a year and make 350 tamales in Oregon, uh, that's unusual in itself. But here's the deal. All my neighbors come, right? My party is 100 people so that I can explain that tradition and what's valuable to me to remember how important it was for my family to do that when I was a little girl. You know, and it took some time. You know, I, there was a break in that time. And now I keep telling my girls, 
I won't do this forever, and I need you to carry on this tradition because it's important to bring that community together. So you, you have to remember when I go visit, my grandmother lives by herself in California. I get to see her just every so often, and when I go down there, she opens the door. It's the same look. The house is exactly the same. The sheets are folded the same. The towels, you know, it's like it brings you back, and I just want my kids to have that tradition, and, and tamales is one of those ways. I'm coming. I'm coming for tamales. They're so good. <laughs> so, Crystal? Um, uh, just very briefly, I, I think uh, just find interest in the things that relate to your culture. Um, you know, find out what people are advocating for in your community and, um, you know, see what's, what's popular, what art and culture is out there and, and, you know, see if you can, you know, we're so fortunate we have the internet at our fingertips so you can kind of communicate in that way and, and get, get your, uh, your information from that. But also just getting involved in your community. Um, you'll naturally just pick up on those traditions and on your culture. Um, so, yeah. So I'm immersed in it. I mean, my my district is is 77% um, Latino. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my neighborhood is Latino. I mean, it's every restaurant around me is a Mexican restaurant. I can walk to one and get there in 10, <laughs> 10 minutes. But I think what's important is that, you know, we have to lay that foundation. You know, I still remember my my parents telling me, nunca te olvides que eres Garcia. I mean, said that because look at me, I'm very fair. I could have easily passed and called myself something else. But they always reminded me not to forget who I was and where I came from. So I think that's important that we pass that to our children uh, because I think that's the bigger challenge is how do we pass on our traditions, our culture, and our language uh, to, to my nieces and nephews, you know, the grandchildren. How do we get there? So we've got to always make sure that we, we keep it there, whether it's making the tamales at Christmas or, or, or uh, you know, doing a brujeria once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people that we probably can think of who to do it on. Uh, you know, celebrating Dia de los Muertos. I mean, like that. Oh I, I think that uh, movie Coco oh, yes. has done more for our kids, <laughs> for them to really identify and understand some of their traditions than anything else in the world recently. So those are the kinds of things we need to do. And as elected official. You know, my job is to support the ethnic study programs. My job is to ensure that the school books have bilingual, bicultural uh, 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 words in there. So it's, it's about doing all those things, but frankly, it starts at home mm -hmm. and what we do and what we show the next generation so that we can pass it on. All right, thank you. All right, one more, okay, in the middle. Yes, multicolored hair person. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you for my hair. Um, my name is. <laughs> I, I walk around and people know me for it. Um, my name is Nicole Martinez. I just moved from Puerto Rico less than a year ago, so I would say like nine months. Um, I really want to enter into public service, and we were talking about how Latinas have the benefit of intersection, right? And I think that that's true, but there's still a lot of stereotyping that we face. And currently, I live in Miami. Miami has a very strong Cuban you know, uh, Cuban heritage, and I was wondering how can you guys convince people to elect for you and to trust you when they're different communities and they have different um, uh, points of view and opinions? Good question. Right, because there is intersectionality within mm -hmm. Latinos, right? Like that is always the elephant in the room when you get a bunch of us together, mm -hmm. that, you know, and God is the World Cup, so forget it. Mm -hmm. Our tensions are at peak right now, like orange level threat, right? <laughs> Any Argentinians, any consoling? <laughs> I, no, no. <laughs> but it's a really good question, though, because at the same time that we are fighting for more global recognition of our collective power, each of us is also saying, but I'm different than her, right. and I'm different than her, mm -hmm. and I don't like tamales, I like tostones, <laughs> and you know, like there's all these this nuance that we want. So, how, Christopher, tell us a little bit about what the science and the studies and the analysis tells us about how and whether that's actually achievable to have two things that seem to be in conflict. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, it also depends on where you're running, right? So Latinos tend to vote panethically, like, you know, despite nationality or any of those differences, when they're in communities that are um, you know, uh, close together and adjacent to maybe like a majority white community. So it could also be where you're at, or you could run in a, in a community that isn't majority Latino, and nationality matters way less when you're like, Latina, I'm just so happy you're here, you know? Like, so, <laughs> right? Um, and, so, and so that's another, another um, big aspect. But I think the other thing is, 
Um, it's, a, it's about sort of finding those commonalities and finding ways for people to see that your struggles are similar <laughs> um, and see that there's something that you understand through your experience as a Puerto Rican woman um, that people can relate to, right? Um, and that people can, you know, they share in common and that they care about. Um, so, yeah. All right, well, we're going to end it there no because otherwise they're going to pull us off the stage. Yes. You guys have been great. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank to you. the three of you. Thank you.